Welcome to Hamel Vision. I'm your host, Andrew Hamel, coming at you from high above the mean streets of Dusseldorf, Germany, which gave the world the pioneering synth-pop band Kraftwerk, Brother Theodore, the inventor of stand-up tragedy, <laughs> look at him go, and of course, Augustus Gloop from Dusseldorf. This is episode three in my series on the Zuring case. The topic is the many changing stories of Yen Zuring. We'll start from 1986 and take you up to the present day, showing you how many times Yen Zuring has changed his story and why. I'll wrap up with a few thoughts on why inmates invent innocent stories and why journalists messed this up so badly. We're going to have some fun with this one. This is not because I intend any disrespect, but some of Team Zuring's stories are just so over the top and I couldn't resist a few jokes. Now to our main feature. Zuring's story number one, I killed the Hasems alone. This is by far Zuring's most important story because it's the only true one. The first stage is from June 1986 to March 1990. Beginning on June 5th, 1986, Zuring gave a full confession to two British detectives and one American detective in the Richmond Police Station in England. Zuring described in detail when, where, how, and why he killed the Hasems. His primary motive, as he told the detectives, was his hatred of Derek and Nancy Hasem because of their interference with his obsessive relationship to Elizabeth Hasem. Zuring repeated these confessions to two British forensic psychiatrists in the autumn of 1986 and to a German prosecutor named Bernd Kernisch on December 30th, 1986. For almost four years, from June 1986 to March 1990, Zuring never once suggested to anyone that his confessions were false or that he had been pressured into confessing. Zuring allowed the world to believe he had committed a brutal double murder. Indeed, according to a letter Zuring wrote to British detective Terry Wright in June 1986, Zuring intended to write a book about his relationship to Elizabeth, his murder of the Hasems, and his flight from the law. The question which has bedeviled Zuring for the last three decades is this. If you confessed falsely to protect Elizabeth Hasem, why did you wait four years to reveal this fact to the world? Remarkably, this question doesn't seem to have occurred to any journalists until recently. His supporters didn't ask him. Either they didn't care about the answer or didn't want to risk offending him. But journalists also never asked him this. Sometimes that was because the journalists were also supporters. But more often, it was because the journalists were ignorant of the facts. They had neither the patience nor the commitment to research the decades of history in the case. They just wanted a five-minute story with a few quotes from Yen Zering about how he'd been railroaded by American injustice. At his trial in June 1990, Zering revealed his new story. He confessed in 1986 because he wanted to save Elizabeth from execution by taking the blame for the murders she herself had committed. But this creates a problem with his confession in December of 1986. By that time, both Zuring and Hasem were still imprisoned in England, but their relationship was gone. Earlier in December, Hasem had written Zuring to say she was going to return to the USA and plead guilty. That would directly implicate Yen Zuring. Zuring was horrified. He responded with an angry letter which destroyed their relationship. Nevertheless, on December 30th, 1986, just weeks after this dramatic rupture, Zuring again confessed the crime, this time to Bernd Kernisch, the German prosecutor. Zuring couldn't have been motivated by a desire to sacrifice himself for Elizabeth since they had broken up, and Elizabeth was about to do something that would damage Zuring's legal case. So Zuring needed a new explanation for this December interview. Zuring now says he only confessed on December 30th, 1986 to make it possible for him to be tried for murder in Germany. But if he were actually innocent and had falsely confessed, why would he want to be tried anywhere? Why wouldn't he tell everyone, this is just a big misunderstanding, I'm totally innocent? The situation becomes even more bizarre after Elizabeth pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 90 years in prison in October 1987. Zuring claimed he confessed falsely to prevent Elizabeth from being sentenced to death. But now there was no chance of that happening. Why didn't Zuring step forward and reveal to the world his plan to confess falsely? After all, 
His plan had already worked. Even if the American police believed Suring when he said Elizabeth had killed her parents, they couldn't have done anything. Under the U.S. Constitution, no person could be tried twice for the same crime. Elizabeth had an ironclad constitutional guarantee that she would never be put on trial again. As always, Suring has an excuse. Suring, by this time, had filed a case before the European Court of Human Rights saying he shouldn't be extradited to the U.S. because he would face the death penalty. That appeal was still ongoing in October 1987, and it wouldn't be decided until later. To explain why he kept silent, Zering says he raised the issue of innocence with his lawyers at the time, but they told him to keep his mouth shut. Here's the excerpt from his 1995 book, Mortal Thoughts. Hesitantly, I asked the attorneys, what is my legal position if I were not guilty? My lawyer's eyes immediately widened in horror. Heaven forbid the possibility of my innocence. To have any hope at all of gaining a binding assurance that the death penalty would not be imposed, it was essential to maintain my complete guilt throughout the extradition proceedings. If we conceded that I might have a defense against the murder charges, the appellate judges would rule that I needed no binding assurance, because an innocent man would presumably not be convicted and executed anyway. The legal term for this was the necessity of proving the seriousness of risk of execution, the attorneys explained. So if I wanted to live, nobody could know that I had not killed the Hasems. Even then, I could not help but smile at the poetic irony of my position. My innocence, if it became known, would kill me. This is what Zering says his lawyers told him. I wonder what an actual lawyer would think. Oh, wait, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and I say there are many problems with this story. First of all, lawyers' eyes do not widen in horror at anything. Lawyers are the proctologists of the human soul. We've heard it all. Second, the legal issues in Zering's case were technical points related to international treaties. Zering's own statements about his confessions were totally irrelevant. The court would have simply ignored them. Third, assuming the court actually did take them into account and decided Zering was innocent, well, they wouldn't have extradited him. What would be the point? They would have ordered him to be released. So, the chances that Zering's lawyers actually said these things is therefore zero. Of course, I may be wrong. If Zering's lawyers really did tell him these things, Zering can sign a one-page waiver of lawyer confidentiality and let them speak. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Now we come to July 7th, 1989, when the European Court of Human Rights published its decision in Zering versus United Kingdom. The court held that Zering could not be extradited to Virginia as long as Virginia planned to try to execute him. So Virginia agreed not to do so. After July 7, 1989, Zering had already saved Elizabeth from execution, no longer had to wait for the court decision. So did he then come out and tell the world that he was innocent? No, he did not. Why not? When he was finally asked this question after 30 years, he again had an answer. His lawyers said not to reveal his confessions were false because that was their defense trial strategy. If you're keeping score at home, this is the third excuse for why Zering kept silent about his false confessions for four years. Zering says he and his lawyers had worked out a trial strategy. Zering would take the stand at his trial, claim he confessed falsely, blame Elizabeth for the murders. His lawyers told him to keep this strategy secret so they could surprise the prosecution at trial. But as we'll see, public records contradict this claim. Once again, we have only Zering's word for this, unless he releases his lawyers from their duty of confidentiality. Yeah. That's not going to happen. One question you might be asking is, what did Zering tell his family? You wouldn't be alone. Zering has faced this question numerous times. After all, Zering's family communicated with him regularly from 1986 to 1990. Did he tell him he had indeed killed the Hasems? Or did he tell him his confessions were false and Elizabeth had done the deed? Zering's answer to both of these questions is yes. In a 2007 interview, German talk show host Johannes B. Kerner asked Zering whether, when his family visited him before his trial, 
he had told them the truth, i.e. that Zuring was in fact innocent of murder and had confessed falsely. Zuring responded, Of course, natürlich. Yet, in his interview for the Netflix documentary, Till Murder Do Us Part, Zuring says that his father asked him whether he'd committed the murders. Zuring says he told his father he had indeed committed the murders, and that was the first time Zuring had ever seen his father cry. So, of course, when Zuring says he lied to his father, when he said he'd killed the Hasems, he was actually telling the truth. And the reason he lied to his father to avoid interfering with the court case was itself made up. So, which version is true? We'll never know. Zuring's family has never given any press interviews since the trial and broke off all contact with Zuring in 2001. Zuring's father and brother are still alive, but they will never speak to the press for any reason. And who can blame them? If you're confused, don't worry. You're not alone. The world of Zuring's stories is a crazy, mixed-up, funhouse mirror, parallel universe where nothing is as it seems. This is why so many people comment Zuring's videos with things like, wait a minute, I don't understand why you said this or something or other. The reason it makes no sense to these commenters is that it makes no sense to anyone. In any case, Zuring was extradited to Virginia and landed in January 1990. His lawyers were Richard Neaton and William A. Cleveland, an experienced Virginia criminal lawyer who had been a former prosecutor. They had the thankless task of defending a man who had confessed to a double murder, not just once, but at least five separate times. Which leads us to Zuring story number two, Cops Forced Me to Confess. In early March 1990, the Bedford County Circuit Court held a hearing on whether Zuring's confessions would be used against him at his later trial. No jury was present. Detectives Ricky Gardner, Kenneth Beaver, and Terry Wright testified that they warned Zuring of his legal rights and that Zuring signed written waivers agreeing to speak to them without a lawyer present. On March 2, 1990, Zuring took the witness stand. For the first time in nearly four years, he claimed that his confessions were not voluntary. Why? Because Kenneth Beaver had threatened Elizabeth Hasem with harm. According to Zuring's sworn testimony, Beaver said, Elizabeth's a very pretty girl all along in that cell block. It would be an awful shame if she fell down and hurt herself. And at that time, Beaver turned to me and raised his eyebrows like this and looked me in the eye like that. He didn't have his glasses on. Did you say anything to him after he said that? No, I was just shocked and open-mouthed. It was like a bad TV or movie thing. I just looked at him, shocked. Beaver, of course, denied this. Zuring's sworn testimony could have ended Beaver's career or even put him in prison, but nobody believed it. Defendants who have gotten themselves into trouble by confessing come up with bull <clears throat> nonsense like this all the time to try to undo the damage. Judge William Sweeney was not convinced. In a ruling on Zuring's confessions, Sweeney wrote, Simply stated, I do not believe Zuring on this issue. He produced no corroboration, written or oral. The officer emphatically denied making such a statement, and the subsequent taped interviews, which the court listened to for five hours, gave no suggestion that Zuring was acting under duress at any time. Additionally, his concern for Elizabeth Hasem at the time seems strange, since he freely implicated her in his early statements to police. Ouch! As the American saying goes, shots fired. It's worth noting that in this March 2, 1990 trial testimony, which you can read in full on my website, Zuring never claimed his confession was false. He only said he had been forced to confess against his will. Zuring continued to accuse Kenneth Beaver of extortion and perverting the course of justice in his English language books, but not in the German language ones, since Germany has much more restrictive libel laws than the USA. In any case, story number two was soon replaced by an even more spectacular version. Zuring story number three. Elizabeth killed her parents alone, and I falsely confessed to cover up for her crime. 
Zering's lawyers realized that nobody was going to buy Zering's accusations against Beaver. They needed a new strategy. Less than a month after Zering had testified on April 1, 1990, an article by Monica Davey entitled Zering May Shift Blame appeared in a Virginia newspaper. Davey noted that Zering's attorneys have yet to spell out their strategy concerning his upcoming trial, but have, however, hinted at one possible theory they may try to argue that Elizabeth Hasem, not Zuring, killed her parents. Davy also noted that Zuring's new story might be hard for a jury to swallow. Huh, prophetic words. Before we go any further, let's return to Zuring's excuses for not recanting his confessions earlier. Zuring says that after July 1989, when he won in the European court, his lawyers told him he must not recant his confessions and proclaim his innocence because that was going to be their trial strategy. But as we've just seen, that wasn't their trial strategy. Their trial strategy was to get the confessions excluded from evidence, because Zuring had been forced to give them against his will. Only when that strategy failed did they turn to the I confessed falsely to protect Elizabeth strategy. Zuring's version can't be true. Of course, Zuring can clear up all the doubts on this point by signing a one-page form allowing his lawyers to talk about his case, but you know the drill. Yeah, that's not going to happen. But now back to story three. At his June 1990 trial, Zuring told the jury the version we're all familiar with. Elizabeth drove to Lynchburg, Virginia, killed her parents, then drove back to Washington and confessed her crime to Zuring. She even had dried blood on her forearms from the awful deed. During this trial testimony, Zuring did not say anyone else had been involved. Elizabeth had killed her parents by herself in a drug-fueled rage. Zuring was annihilated on cross-examination by Prosecutor Jim Updike. The jury found that Zuring had again lied under oath and convicted him. In 1995, Zuring made the fateful, ominous, very bad decision to publish a book about his case called Mortal Thoughts. Zuring's supporters later tried desperately to remove this book from the internet. We'll see why shortly. Alas for Zuring, the internet never forgets. In Mortal Thoughts, Zuring gives us this written version of his trial testimony. Elizabeth killed her parents. She did so as a result of taking drugs. Zuring never tells us what they were. These drugs are so strong they caused her to kill her own parents but allowed her to drive eight hours round trip, most of it at night. Then she returned to the Washington Marriott at around 2.30 a.m., literally with her parents' dried blood still on her arms. She confessed he'd, she had murdered her own mother and father. She doesn't mention any accomplices. The publication of Mortal Thoughts was a case of very bad timing. Why? Well, because just as it was entering cyberspace, where it lives forever... Zuring's lawyers were coming up with Zuring Story 4. Elizabeth and two random drifters murdered the Hasems. During Zuring's appeals in Virginia state courts, his lawyer, Gail Marshall, came up with a bold new theory. Two drifters, William Shiflett and Robert Albright, had murdered Derek and Nancy Hasem. Shiflett and Albright had indeed killed another drifter named Milliken, in a city 30 miles away from the Hasem home shortly after the Hasems were murdered. They had also been picked up by a police car a few miles away from the Hasem home about a week after the Hasem murders. Zuring's appeals lawyers said this was vital information. Shiflett and Albright could have killed the Hasems. But wait, you might be asking. I thought Elizabeth killed them alone. In Mortal Thoughts, she says, I killed my parents, not we did. She never mentions any accomplices. She certainly participated in the killings, since Suring saw dried blood on her forearms. Well, perhaps the drifters helped her, but left no traces of the crime scene. Then Elizabeth decided never to mention them to anybody for the rest of her life. Here is a symbolic picture of one female and two male accomplices. I have chosen the Philadelphia Flyers hockey team mascot, Gritty, because he like Elizabeth's male accomplices, is a fictional character. During his appeals in the mid-1990s, Zuring claimed the prosecution should have told 
Suring's defense about the drifters during his trial five years before. The Virginia court system took this claim seriously. They sent it back for a full evidentiary hearing in 1996. The problem was, though, that at the time of this hearing, Zuring had already published his book, Mortal Thoughts, in 1995, which said Elizabeth killed her parents alone. Zuring's hapless lawyers were saying in court that two drifters killed the Hastings, while their own client was making a totally different argument in a book published on the internet to millions of people. No wonder his supporters have tried to suppress mortal thoughts. Eventually, the courts decided this was all a red herring. There was no evidence the drifters had anything at all to do with the Hasem murders. No valuables, cash, or liquor were stolen. Besides, the theory raises innumerable questions. Assuming Elizabeth also participated in the killings with the drifters, remember dried blood? How did she get to know two random drifters who just happened to be wandering through Virginia at that time? And how did she convince two disheveled, foul-smelling hobos she had just met to help her commit a double murder for no payment, even convincing them to leave behind cash, which was in plain view. And why didn't she mention these men when she supposedly confessed to Suring? Just like the cops forced me to confess story, the two drifters killed the Hasem story was quietly abandoned. After every American court rejected it and the Supreme Court rejected Zuring's case in 2001, the two drifters theory went down the memory hole.